I'll start with an introduction. So uh, welcome to another episode of the Fourth World podcast, Fjärde Världen podden, with me, Stellan Bäckman, Ola Persson and Leif Jakobsson. Uh, today's guest is Terry Martinen, who will talk to us about her research concerning both uh, uh, race biology and the history of um, race biology and uh, its relation to uh, modern day genetics. So, um, Terry, tell us more about yourself, uh, who you are and what you do with your research in general terms. Yeah, I'll start by saying that um, I identify as a Lestadian. I grew up in uh, firstborn Lestadianism, the western branch of Lestadianism that um, <clears throat> that the Sami are affiliated with, and there was the east-west split after his death, and that split um, was simultaneous in North America. So my grandfather immigrated from Finland. He was in Lahti and um, moved to Canada through Toronto and then to Northern Ontario and Sault Ste. Marie, where I reside still, um, and started a home, Lestadian church. Uh, and about a few years later, a school was purchased and um, a Lestadian community was um, <clears throat> established here. More people from Toronto and uh, um, from Finland then <clears throat> came here. So I left Lestadianism formally uh, practicing the religion when I was, you know, in my early 20s. My family continued. My entire family, I have a quite large family, uh, all belong except for my nuclear family, sort of um, have moved on a little bit in their own lives away from Lestadianism. Uh, my experience with Lestadianism, I think, um, along with... Uh, uh, experience with colonialism in Canada. My, my, I had a young spouse who was Indigenous, he was First Nations. We found this out. He uh, suicided uh, when he was 22 years old and he was a part of what we call here in Canada 60 scoop processes which after the residential school system experience of uh, taking kids from, from reserves, um, children were uh, put into foster care, which is still a phenomenon happening here. So we're having disintegration of families um, and uh, with, and uh, conflicts. And this is well known now to have um, uh, been a part of the whole colonial program, and which is being called genocidal program here in Canada, which was a part of the truth and reconciliation identify processes. There's been a legal um, case with the 60 scoop process addressing the trauma of, and the, the breakup of families and financial compensation. So my young spouse, um, uh, his suicide and, uh, you know, we had a daughter led me to go back to school and my experiences of Lestadianism because we, in my own experience of two, uh, two um, sort of parallel experiences of you know, the Swedish colonialism, Canadian colonialism impacting my family personally. So I went to a local university. We have an indigenous focused school here and ended up in Oxford Brooks University in 2014. Studied, uh, supervised PhD. Uh, I addressed colonialism and mental health impacts. That was, uh, I did a more broader um, a research scope looking at the Indian Act and and how gendered uh, the Indian Act impacted women and children. There was a gendered feminized poverty amongst Indigenous people, especially urban Indigenous women and children, and considering how, and from a new post-genomic framework, how, um, how, how mental health inequality, discrimination, Indian Act policy impacts health directly, the role of the environment, social and physical environment. So that's sort of a general background. Um, and then from the MA work in 2015, I published a paper um, and um, I'm working on a second paper, which is related to that 2015 paper, uh, dealing with sort of ongoing issues um, 
I'm dealing with the re reform eugenics at this point and still with the um, the mental health concepts from the post-genomic framework which I've integrated into the published work. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah, so part of that work, um, I'm looking at conflicts between classical genetics and post-genomic concepts and uh, psychoses, major psychoses specifically, uh, because uh, the eugenic program in Sweden, uh, mainline eugenics, the SAMI were focused in actually Norway and Sweden of uh, mainline eugenic theories on mental health, cultural and biological theories, uh, you know, theories of arctic psychoses, that these were predetermined cons, predetermined biological heritable traits within the Sami people. So that kind of dovetailed in with my own experience of colonialism here. So I spread out and continue to look at that because it's a very complex, um, complex mm. history. Mm. And I'm very interested in contextualizing current uh, issues with free, historically framing it so we can better understand the uh, social impacts on health. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you mentioned the your background as a Lestadian, and you, mm -hmm. I've seen you identify sometimes in social media or on social media as a secular Lestadian. But what yeah. does this really mean with being secular Lestadian? Could you just tell us? What's Secular Lestadium isn't a concept in Lestadianism itself. I identify as that. It's a, a, it's a concept uh, Jewish communities and uh, Muslim communities have, have worked out. I've yet to work that out formally. I think it needs to be worked out formally in a paper. Uh, I take it to mean um, rejecting the, the religious tenets, the hierarchical structures of Lestadianism, but I identify Lestadianism as a culture more than a religion. The Sami identify Lestadianism as a way of life. It's still very much in North America, um, a way of life. It's more than a religion. It's an entire uh, framework for organizing social relations within Lestadian communities. And so while I don't observe the religious dimensions of it and the sort of the patriarchy and the hierarchy of the religious order, um, I do maintain sort of cultural elements of communal, uh, communal approaches where the community is, the group is greater than the individual. It still really influences how I do my research connecting with Sami communities, connecting with other Lestadians. Facebook's a huge platform for Sami networking and Lestadian networking. And I, I'm in touch with, um, you know, Sami scholars and, and Lake communities. But another thing about Lestadianism that a lot of people don't understand is that as an anti-rationalist religion that Lestadius um, developed and promoted and was uh, leader of um, was an experiential based religion and um, knowledge was secondary to, to, to lived experience and um, sort of an emotional uh, experience of the world. And I still keep those elements. I still look at the world, uh, you know, I approach my research that way and same within mental health. Um, which I forgot to mention that I'm involved in policy development and mental health care at uh, Canada's largest re research center. And uh, we approach um, lived experience as informing best practices in mental health care. I, and I promote lived experience as a SAMI do in, in informing research from the ground up opposed to Western knowledge epistemologies, which require uh, objective approaches with, you know, from the scientific framework within, you know, came from the Enlightenment um, and has maintained itself in Western academia, which is sometimes very much of a conflict. So I've re only recently really identified that, that this is, was the, you know, this is a part of my cultural experience and it's created conflict for me in academia sometimes.
Uh, Oxford Brooks University was very great at uh, accommodating um, the cultural, you know, the cultural approach, the lived experience approach, and trying to find a balance between, you know, the objective and the and placing yourself within the in the research frame, as in, so. So, so in that way, I would say as a secular Lestadian, I, I keep mm. elements of the cultural experience, which some scholars and many scholars actually argue that um, there's continuity in Lestadianism with, with um, uh, the Sami experience. And I, I agree that there is. There's a, it, it not, it's a very, um, it's a very tense balance or, you know, and it's a very complicated um, discussion amongst Sami and Lestadian scholars, how much continuity of the Sami culture is within Lestadianism, especially as it moved away from sort of the the territories of the, where the Sami and Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway and Finland. But uh, I, I, I suggest uh, it's still a part of the North American experience as well. Mm, I see. Uh, uh, do you, uh, uh, are you self a Sami from Sami background? Do you come from Finland? Or? You know, this is a very difficult thing. Ella Marie Jensen, she's studying at UIT, or she's actually got her finished up her PhD and is teaching, I think, in a gender studies program there, is doing pioneering work on the the lost memory of the Sami through immigration processes. I did, I touched on this in my thesis at uh, Oxford Brookes University, a master's work, address it in my paper a bit. I don't uh, make claims because a part of the history of colonization and the immigration has been an erasure of especially women's identity. And this is something that we're, I work with Sami scholars in the North American side, uh, including Ella Marie Jensen now, who is living in Norway, um, on and sorting this out and reclaiming identity. I don't as of yet, because it's very hard for me to track down my family, family genealogy. And that's a whole story, a whole story in itself. So. Uh, I identify as Lestadian. Our Lestadian church here, the Firstborn Church, which is otherwise called the Old Apostolic Lutheran Church, is still governed by the church in Calavera in northern Sweden. Mm. So I maintain that as a cultural continuity, and I, I, I'm against the bio, biological approaches, which is, you know, I address it in my paper for a reason, the DNA testing. Um, because it subverts sort of the whole lived experience of the colonial experience and all the traumas, the family disconnections and um, that were seen in the Sami experience in the immigration to North America, which parallels, and I understand this because of my own family experience, having a former Indigenous spouse, the 60 scoop, the fragmentation that we're seeing as a result of colonialism. So this is this is a whole piece that um, it would be actually a good project to write about those do a comparative, but I haven't dedicated time to that yet. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, but I was thinking because you have written about Lars Lievelestadius and his role mm -hmm. in the colonization of the Sami uh, and his relation to the Swedish state. What what have you found out really? Because he's usually seen as more of a liberator rather than. Very much so, uh, unless you're looking at um, um, Sami feminist literature. Mm. And it's the fa Sami feminist literature which um, I ran into first and, and considered and is very key to my analysis of the, of the um, experience of Lestadianism in Sweden and Norway and taking the Sami feminist perspective to consider um, Lestadianism here in North America. Um, Lestadianism is criticized um, by Sami feminist authors as um, perpetuating Western Christian uh, dualism, the Cartesian dualism, and one of the key um, you know, the, the sin and purity binaries, and we have a, a whore Madonna um, 
binary and this language is a bit harsh but these were actual um, uh, metaphors used by Lestadi and Lestadius himself and um, these these metaphors were applied to Sami women um, on Sara Ranta Ronland uh, was you know criticized very much the harshness of Lestadianism in Swedish Sami communities um, and uh, I rely a lot on uh, Rauno Kokkonen's analysis, contemporary analysis of Lestadianism, uh, that women sexuality uh, has been subverted, uh, discussion of sexuality and even sexual abuse that we're starting to see emerge in discussions in Finland um, and in, in Norway more recently. Uh, there's s allegations of sexual abuse in Nor North America as well that these conversations are suppressed because of these um, very patriarchal structures, hierarchical structures, subversion of sex and sexuality. So while Lestadian is, a, on the one hand, Lestadius is uh, very much looked at as a liberator of the Sami, uh, when we look from a gendered perspective and, and start to look to the feminist analysis, we see a different picture. And that's the picture I'm looking at, is how how the Christian constructs of um, of gender, uh, the concepts of monogamy and marriage, uh, impacted women, created a very different trajectory of experience for women. How Lestadius um, um, facilitated facilitated the assimilation of the Sami in and. In, into Swedish society, which was a goal of the of the nation state at the time. Mm. So you know he was very much. So this is this is a the thing about Lestadianism. It's on the one hand because he's recognized as using um, uh, mythology, Sami mythology, to promote the to promote the religion, identify with the Sami. Uh, you know, he spoke and related to Sami, but I'm identifying it was as, you know, as an internal colonizing process. And I have no answers on, you know, there's no clear um, demarcation on or one size fits all solution for um, whether it's a, you know, his, whether he had a, a, a totally negative or a positive experience on preserving Sami culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is this is an ongoing debate and issue, and it's a very gendered one. I think that requires further an ongoing discussion. Mm, yeah, but did he have uh, like close contact with some race biologists of you know, Swedish state or? Well, you know what I've what I've identified. You know, Lestadian is a pronatalist religion. Pronatalism. Um, Marius, Marius Tirda uh, argues in Modernism and Eugenics and historizing, not, not so much historizing race, but um, Modernism and Eugenics, and he has another book discussing the links between uh, eugenics and religion, that, that religion predated mainline eugenics, that it was, be, it was like, a, it was an outgrowth. And we see in Lestadianism, um, positive eugenics, which is the encouragement of, you know, uh, promoting, building the, building the race from, through birthing, multiple, promoting multiple births. And it's Lestadianism, we have, still have bans on contraception. Lestadian himself had a huge family and I haven't done a specific analysis on, on the positive eugenics, but I identify him as a eugenicist in my 2015 paper, as a as a predating the mainline eugenics, and that the mainline eugenic program picked up on that kind of ideology out of the, out of that out of the Christian paradigm. Mm -hmm. So, what have the reaction from scholars who are more like into saying that Lestadius is a liberator reacted to your research or this type of research, do you know? Well, I think 
positive in North America because, you know, supported by Sami scholars in North America. My paper was added to Cultural Heritage Site, Dalal Online, which is um, a dedicated site for research into Lestadius because he, he had a major impact on Nordic cultural heritage. So, um, you know, I see that as sort of a general acceptance. I think, on the other hand, there's a bit of um, um, uh, silence around uh, the DNA component uh, that I address in my research. Because uh, um, I, I disseminate it through networks. And Canada has a very well developed colonial, decolonial, indigenous feminist analysis. It's very accepted in Canada. And um, in Nordic countries, the, the you know, decolonial analysis isn't as common, I don't think. I think it's becoming more popular. There's Canadian Indigenous uh, people are working with Sami scholars now. There's international collaborations between the Sami people, Canadian Indigenous people, scholars, and including in the truth and reconciliation processes happening in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. If the people who were on the Canadian, organizing the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission processes are actually aiding, I know in the Norway case anyway. So I think, um, I think there's, there's a discrepancy there, like to pick up on that, um, you know, that decolonial uh, analysis and especially Indigenous feminist analysis. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, let's move on towards another, another part of your research, which is, I mean, it kind of challenged the the official view on Swedish race biology and its history. I mean, it, usually it's seen as starting and ending with Hermann Lundborg, but you have focused a bit on the post Lundborgian kind of uh, eugenics and so forth. Could you? Tell us a bit more about this, what you've seen. Well, Hermann Lundborg, as everybody knows, was, you know, focused on the physical anthropology of the mm. Sami. He was uh, also uh, a geneticist and studied disease. And um, I, I consider um, Jan Arden Book, who was um, an assistant to Gunnar Dahlberg, who took over the Race Biological Institute after Hermann Lundberg's retirement. Uh, Gunnar, Gunnar Dahlberg, as you may know, was instrumental in drafting the sterilization laws in Sweden. And he was uh, studied, this, studied the Sami and uh, quite extensively, I think, as well. And I identify a shift started under his leadership um, from considering mixed race and degeneration of, of, of human biology um, and as a cause of disease um, to looking at consanguity and, or, or what was called in eugenic jargon was in, 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 in inbreeding and first cousin marriages in, in the north. So the program, you see continuity uh, in, on this uh, studies were done in the north shifted from that physical anthropology to mixed race to this new research paradigm which i don't say it was so much of a research it was a it was a technical shift with the same ideological underpinnings um key to that um then was Tristan sorjorn i don't know how to pronounce his name but he was a psychiatrist and geneticist also at that time, uh, working with uh, Gunnar Dahlberg and at the Race Biological Institute. And he was considering psychosis specifically and trained by Ernst Rudin um, in Germany, who was instrumental in race hygiene in Nazi Germany. So this is what I, this is sort of the research that I chased down in this paper that's uh, accepted for publication will be published in I think with COVID now early in 2021. 
Um, so I, I look at that connection between Nazi eugenics, sterilization processes, but more what I do is I, I then follow, I do sort of an archaeo, you know, excavation of the medical research by Jan Arden book, which, which was published, started in the 1940s, was published in 1953, continued to the 1980s. And central to this was geographical isolate research. So what happened was, um, rather than di overt discussions of race, which through UNESCO, after the Holocaust, um, Gunnar Dahlberg was involved in discounting race as a, as a, you know, as a concept, but the language significantly changed. But what ended up happening was there was a shift to looking at geographical ice, isolates and proving the biological purity of isolates um, associated. Uh, so race became associated with geography. Geography was the associated with national identity. We see that in the experience of Torn Finns, who Jan Book studied, three communities in Norbotten. One of them was Pajala, which was uh, where uh, the Stadius oversaw the Pajala district. And the people he studied were Lestadians, which interestingly in a historical continuity, we have Sami in mainline eugenics, um, Lestadians from Norway studied um, for um, as through blood, uh, you know, blood theories of inheritance for psychoses. Now we've shifted to technical updates in, um, in research on torn fins and looking at um, cohesive genetic concepts in the professionalization of genetics at the former Race Biological Institute, which changed its name what, sometime in the 50s. Jan Book, over, over, he took over the administration from Dalberg. Dalberg died in 1959 and he took over that, that program. So I, I, I look at that, the geographical isolate um, argument, and then when we look at it with, there's Lars Beckman, who was doing migration research in parallel on the SAMI out of the Race Biological Institute. He did his PhD there. And when we look at all these players together, uh, we see in the research references to Lundberg's research, um, in the schizophrenia research on torn fins by Jan Book and Herman or Lars Beckman also doing geographical isolate research on the SAMI, um, built on the work of Lundborg, ice, recognizing the you know the northern SAMI, um, and uh, so I try to tease all that apart. Mm -hmm very I complicated tr trace the connections and in not in only in in practical terms between the people involved throughout the history but also conceptually mm. a mm. two-pronged approach mm. Mm. Ula and Leif, do you have any follow-up questions or your microphone is off Ula. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to hear someone, so to speak, from outside Sweden talk about uh, race biology and Hermann Lundborg as a sort of phenomenon. We who live here, and I have seen it more as something that exists, that is here, that was here and sort of not naturally. But it was strange and, and awful, but it, it's uh, interesting to hear someone talk about it from from another perspective. I think I think what's really interesting, you know, is um, what kind of helped me, you know, how I clued into this as a research subject was the historical piece on the Sami who were, there was a famous rebellion in 1852, the Kotikaino rebellion or uprising. I don't know if, if you've heard about it. I mean, it's been well written, and out of that, there were Lestadians and um, 
the, the Stadians were psychopathologized after that event as fan, religious fanatics and the bona fide um, uh, prone to mental illness, psychoses in specifically. And this happened from 1852 at the moment it happened from a French psychiatrist coming in. The Stadius himself, this is the other piece where I, the Stadius psychopathologizing the Sami. In he, had, he wrote an autobiography between 19, 1852 and 1854 and uh, discussed that event in roundabout terms and identified Sami women as pr prone to hysteria and fanaticism, sort of trying to rationalize that event as um, sort of moral unrestraint and lack of self-control and um, and rationality over emotions in his and that that text is very much omitted in analysis of Lestadianism from what I can see and it's a it requires a gendered analysis to look at it and then mainline eugenesis coming in and up until the 1960s in the social science discussing the Sami Lestadians as uh, prone through blood theories uh, to psychoses. So I'm following that historical story then that we're still in the north and how it shifted to the Finns in by the 1940s and 1950s when genetics became a solidified discipline um, Jan Book was instrumental in cr developing chromosome theory out of the former Institute for Race Biology and was, you know, was to turn the, the institution around uh, into a clinical genetics program, which he, you know, which was successfully done there. So this, there's a little bit of analysis coming out now about Jan Book, a couple of papers talking about his role. And so I'm really interested in that role because my paper that uh, is yet to be pub published identifies that, less, that religious fanaticism was uh, instituted uh, as a symptom of schizophrenia by Jan Book. So when we look at this historically, we're seeing that the the Lestadian religion and culture was appropriated and psychopathologized and actually institutionalized as, as a pathological behavior. This is very serious because I work in psychiatry at a major institution which is a center for the World Health Organization and recognize that uh, Jan Book for a time sat on the World Health Organization um, informing and apprising the um, the discussion on psychiatric genetics and genetics as a whole and schizophrenia and uh, genetic counseling uh, until he he actually developed a drug problem and fell off the face of the earth and I haven't been able to trace him after that um, and managed to get archives to see what happened to him but um, so what we have here then, what I'm concerned about as a Lestadian is the stigmatization of Lestadianism, the stigmatization of Sami people on, based on the race, the stigmatization uh, of torn Finns based on racial identity associated with national identity, and these led to sterilization of women which is a huge issue now and going to be a part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process as I'm sure in the Sami context. What's being absolutely missed is the women diagnosed for schizophrenia in Sweden, uh, in, Norba in Norbotten, the torn Finns, and it would have been the Sami because they were secure, as, you know, indirectly psychopathologized, I outline in the research. Um, they were sterilized and if they were pregnant, uh, their babies were aborted, fetuses were aborted, uh, first admission to hospitals. And this is lost in Swedish data. Talk to Gunnar um, Broberg uh, if he knew about it. And, and uh, at the hospital in Pitya, there's an asylum there that closed in 1987. But there were no records kept of ethnicity in Sweden on who was sterilized. But if you look at the, the research, the medical research, Jan Book and colleagues identified 
uh, women, Finnish women, were sterilized at first admission to hospitals. Official records identify how many people in Norbotten were sterilized. It's just ethnicities not discuss, but we can bring all that research together to identify race-based um, um, sterilization of Torin Finn women, of Sami women, and the psychopathologization of Lestadianism, and that the research agenda out of the former Race Biological Institute actually identified um, Torin Finns and Sami as genetically prone and basically validated the sterilization which was termed medical was rephrased um identified by gunnar broberg and uh, niels rohansen as you it was you know under the, the banner of eugenic stigmatization or eugenic sterilization until the 1950s and they called it for medical indications but it was just a language change opposed to opposed to anything else so so this is, you know, kind of why, you know, I discovered this in the research and I think it's very, very important because with TRC processes and stopping at, at Lundberg, this isn't, the, there's the rest of the story. There's, a, there's, there's the complicity of psychiatry and, and, and medical genetics in Sweden that hasn't really been considered and I think it needs to be very much so. Yeah. yeah, and I know and that, know that. Uh, what, Gunnar Dahlberg, Gunnar Dahlberg. Uh -huh. who succeeded uh, Emma Lundberg, he is usually yeah. described as a uh, anti-racist because he wrote that you know race is mm -hmm. not, not a thing, and then he went on and you know support this type of uh, process as research as you're talking about. You know what actually happened after Lundberg's. Uh, departure from uh, from uh, Ross from uh, Staten's Institute for Ross Biology. I mean, it's very interesting that just by changing the that he's getting sort of like beneath the radar just because he wasn't like beneath the radar. And how they uh, did it, you know, what I identify is that the geographical isolates when they studied did the schizophrenia mm. research and. And this method was from, you know, informed by Ernst Rudin under Nazi-occupied Germany, and he's gone, he's flown under the radar too, is that race was looked at family lines. They studied family genealogy, so they picked three communities and intensively studied parish records and followed up family in longitudinal studies. Mm. And, you know... So this is how it was done. So we're looking at race as families, specific families and geographies from in, you know, with specific national identities. So it was family lines and populations that became the center and the new language of race. Mm, this, mm. Is a, you know, this is identified by other scholars as well. Marius Turda in Historizing Race uh, touches on it and and uh, other scholars in Nordic countries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that brings us to the next question, which is related to what we've been talking to, but you have expressed in some of your papers a sort of criticism towards the popularization of DNA and genetic research, but um, and linking it to, you know, the eugenic paradigm, but you also said in relation to that there is a re-racialization of Sami genes. Uh, could you elaborate on this, what it means? With Yeah, um, I'd, what I noticed was uh, there's, there's a whole new, uh, as a result of this, the immigration and the lost identity of the Sami, there's a bit of a repatriation project going on, I'll mm. call it which is a, um, a trying to find uh, sort of sort of the roots because there's been a lost memory and I identified in my work that uh, racism played a role in this in in Sweden and Finland and Norway and uh, but immigration processes families move on people just want to forget the past and they build new lives and it's a part of the assimilation process so there's been a turn to biological identification to try to identify family history. 
and um, this is uh, this is very controversial in Indigenous communities here because we've got similar issues here, of uh, or in, and in the United States, and more so I think maybe. And um, Kim Talbert talks extensively about it in Native American DNA, what the issues are in an Indigenous context. Uh, in the Sami context, um, what's happening is uh, the consumer genetic companies are selling ancestry testing as leisure pursuits for hobbyists and people are getting tested and some have identified there's a genetic signature U5B1 which is a female SAMI MT DNA um, identified as SAMI associated with, nor with northern SAMI specifically which is controversial in itself because SAMI is a very heterogeneous group of people and you know there's northern and southern SAMI and um, so again we're using you know these biological constructs to identify a person we're erasing culture right out of the mix this is this is a major issue when indigenous communities identify through culture not through biology mm. and it undermines the indigenous self-identification period in, you know, whether it's Sami, North, North American Indigenous people in Canada or the United States. So um, what I'm seeing is we're creating new geographical isolates, you know, biological resources that are, but it, and it's, it's allowed to happen because in national contexts, Sami have control over their genetic material. They have a say in how the ethics of how it's uh, approached in migration research that Beckman, Lars Beckman undertook in medical research. Same with in Canada, Indigenous peoples uh, research, uh, genomic and otherwise is very heavily regulated in, um, in, uh, in the direct to consumer they, uh, context. Uh, they get or they get around all of that because there's no national laws. There's mm -hmm. calls to to regulate to regulate this. So what I'm seeing in the mental health context now is that when people are doing ancestry testing and you have an option to opt in for medical testing. Once again, we're bracketing out, uh, and this was key to the Swedish uh, schizophrenia. Uh, isolate research, all environmental considerations are bracketed out and these are, you know, purely reductionist biological approaches, which is another identifier of, that we're dealing with a concept of race. And this is happening in the contemporary uh, consumer genetic research. So while Sami peoples have intermixed, um, they're still, they're going to, they're looking in new admixture research to segregate out SAMI biology out of out of a, on a micro micro level, so we have like a, just a whole new level of exploitation of just reducing a person to their genetic material. So that's kind of what I I mean by that, and it's a very um, complicated subject here because people want to know who they are. There's a mm. there's you know SAMI people, and there's a whole history. Um, but uh, genealogical approaches are a far better um, and more culturally appropriate way to establish your identity. And, you know, getting back to the start, I mean, I don't, because it, this is difficult in my case because uh, the family history and story has been lost, but um, this, this DNA identity is so problematic that uh, it's not possible to use it, it's not legitimate. You know, and Kim Talbert brings up the point too that when we're looking at Sami identity through DNA, like we're cherry picking identity as well, especially, you know, when we're, you know, you have the diaspora, the Sami diaspora here. You know, I have uh, Finnish and Karjalainen and, um, you know, mm. heritage and. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it reminds me, I mean, I've been. As a side note, I've been like hanging around in genealogists uh, forums on Facebook and there is a tendency, I mean, pretty much everybody who is 
trying to find about their own ancestry in Sweden. Mm -hmm. They might say, when I say that I have some Finnish ancestry, they say, oh, but I have a Finnish ancestor from the 16th centuries, but it's sort of like, what does it mean? But still, they make a connection with yeah. who they are now, even though there is a minuscule, you know, actual connection. So, I mean, yeah. it parallels how this uh, process of re-racializing the Sami genes that you were yeah. spoken of, I mean, and making it part of someone's whole identity, I mean. I find it, um, you know, because if people are making biological remote uh, DNA connections to mm. relatives. Meanwhile, in the actual lived communities, you have a disintegration of families. You have fam you have Sami identity and status that has been totally impacted through colon Swedish colonialism. Women have been um, disproportionately impacted and uh, status as Sami erased because of the, the laws and identity uh, tied to occupation of reindeer herding in Sweden and you know name changing and there's been so much confusion so it's really you when you see this uh, this identifying just biologically you can see you know that a, as a racial program what it is you know what it is it totally it totally erases sort of the the negative experience and the stories of people who are still living with trauma. I mean, the, this is the uh, is this is quite obvious even in, in the Swedish context that there's a lot of trauma with this, with uh, you know structural racism going on, and it's no different here. There's mm. still traumas, and you know, in my own personal situation, my my historical research in part is to understand the colonial story not only of my my young spouse as a first nations person um my daughter doesn't have status because uh he was taken from the community he died before you know we found out after death and then trying to re-establish status and identity is just mm. a huge ordeal just in in her context and then in my context it's been a huge ordeal we can't uh, we can't bypass this in history these are these are stories and and issues and problems that need to be solved in a cultural context and worked out and dna testing tries to bypass all that and and to have people use it recreationally i think is uh, very problematic mm. Mm. i see um Leif, Ola, do you have any questions or anything? Uh, no, I just, uh, uh, I, I remember in, in university when I was uh, studying anthropology, there was a, a, a feminist uh, a, a woman who uh, had interviewed uh, Lestadianist uh, women and she said that uh, she thought that uh, they were very strong and so forth. And um, so she put it uh, that way. Also, so, yeah. yeah, there's that. There's the strong Sami woman hypothesis that that <laughs> that gets um, you know picked apart a little bit. And um, so, while that's the case, because it's important not to reduce uh, Indigenous people or Lestadians to to uh, you know victimhood. And they're, you know, the Sami people, the Stadians are resilient people. And uh, there's those, you know, old stories of extinction, that, you know, that the indigenous people are becoming extinct and because they're victims, you know, total victims of colonialism. No, there is strength there, but there's also traumas there that need to be worked out and, and um, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Ola, you were saying something, but your microphone was off. Uh, yeah, I just said that I don't have him. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, I would like to know more about your methods for your research, because I know that you uh, sort of work with a framework that's rooted in theories concerning decolonization and feminism, yeah. but how, in your view, do they sort of interact with each other? They're, I mean, they're, they're Using both at the same time are not given, sort of, as far as I know. Well, decolonialism, um, 
as a theoretical tool, um, decenters Western epistemologies. It's often used to look at, uh, you know, inequalities. Uh, indigenous scholars criticize de the use of decolonial theory just as a theoretical concept because in indigenous context when you're doing decolonizing research it has land attached to it and rights and responsibilities to the Sami or to the to indigenous people and um, I try to I identify with Sami uh, feminist research which is sort of a mixture of de decolonizing and feminist research because there's you know feminism there's white feminism which actually supported uh, eugenics and um, and totally dismiss or doesn't recognize disability and um, they actually promoted um, eradication of disabled people and didn't support you know still doesn't doesn't so readily recognize the reproductive rights of disabled people etc um, or indigenous issues and can sometimes or oftentimes work against indigenous issues so um, I really rely on uh, or learned a lot from Sami feminists and in the decolonial approaches which is um, you know, and I and I do that because the Stadianism that I'm attached to is um, uh, still grounded in Sweden. Mm -hmm. It's still informed by you know the Stadian governance, of the church and the mother church, as it's called, and the female reference in Sweden. And I I, I use uh, decolonial theory to sort of gaze back at colonial structures, and in this case, medicine. Um, rather, and they're the object of research. And decolonial theory allows me to do that. Sami feminist research helps me to look at gender structures. When I look at when I'm learning from how Sami feminists apply and look look at uh, the gender binary binaries, focus on uh, the patriarchal structures and women's issues. And I'm very interested in Rauna Kokonen's analysis on. Uh, uh, structural abuses within Sami communities. So what I can in the Lestadian context and how we can use that as Lestadians that are non-Sami outside of Sweden and what can we learn from that um, and apply to analysis. Mm -hmm. I, I reference, uh, I, you know, I try to center Sami feminist uh, authors and not speak for them in my work. So mm. I, I, you know, I, I bring it right directly into my work and, and allow Sami authors to speak for themselves rather than try to interpret what they're saying and um, manipulate the theories to, you know. Mm. So there's, yeah. a, there's a crosstalk between the theoretical tools, but also rely on critical race theory, uh, you know, to look at to look at how the race concept evolved and I've kind of identified in my paper that race is inherently um, gendered and um, and has a you know a dualist like um, ableism or you know a concept of ableism uh, inherent to it and um, that it's sort of by looking at the concept of race we can also look at how race was gendered and structured mm. and I and that's how that's kind of, that's the approach I take when I'm looking at the medical genetics under book mm. and yeah. colleagues and the research paradigm yeah, so. yeah. Um, so could you tell us something about COVID-19 and how it's affected marginalized communities in Canada because I mean we I mean, the, the reports here in Sweden on North America is more about the U.S. and, you know, how Trump does his thing and stuff like that, but... Yeah, I think, okay, yeah, I think it's really important to talk about it. Because one thing we didn't touch on, my paper very much deals with post-genomic con uh, concepts. Mm. So what I introduce is a reconstruction effort after looking at classical genetics, uh, reform eugenics, is um, invalidated. 
and so invalidating it means you know you have to replace it so I've been working on uh, HERV concepts which is an infectious based hypothesis for schizophrenia which reveals that the environment actually alters the, gen the gen human genome through viral genes interaction with viral genes so it's a very complicated discussion but um, COVID COVID now, I'm very interested in it and would love to look at it in terms of this new post-genomic hypothesis. It's still too early to do that right now. Um, but um, COVID here, uh, I work on that with, at CAMH. So I sit on a, a, a consulting committee at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, which is in Toronto. It's the provincial um, support system program. We inform policy change and advise on practical application, you know, mental health treatments and so on come through our committee and we help evaluate and advise on these things. We're dealing with COVID right now as a committee group and the end of September have to deliver presentations to the executive identifying major equity issues and we have major equity issues across affecting Indigenous populations who the fear has been early in COVID um, uh, uh, totally ne very negatively impacting Indigenous communities, especially on reserves. There's this boil water advisories on some reserves, extreme poverty on some reserves, uh, lack of resources, lack of medical facilities. Um, apparently, uh, what I've read recently was uh, COVID is leveling out on Indigenous communities. Um, in uh, Toronto, Ontario, I live in Ontario, Toronto is our major, one of our major centres, has uh, a very high um, black community, uh, people of colour, and um, the people of colour, black communities, um, and low income communities which intersect are being impacted the most with COVID and COVID deaths. So this has created a major backlash. Um, race data is not being collected. It's similar to the, you know, the, you know, capturing race, ethnicity uh, in, for medical, you know, the sterilizations in Sweden. We're not collecting data either here on race. So this has become a, a priority to and pressure to start collecting data so we can understand how racism, structural racism is impacting communities, how poverty is feeding into that, who, who is actually being uh, impacted. So my, my focus is, uh, our, is disability communities and um, I'm looking at um, mental health impacts because we have not only COVID directly infecting people, there's there's a mental health fallout because of the poverty and the neglect. And I'm very much concerned about that. Right now we have uh, bailout packages, which aren't bad. In Ontario, COVID is leveled out, is it's flattening, the curve is flattening. But there's pockets of people that are suffering greatly here and they are the racialized, indigenous and other racialized communities, disabled people, um, who disabled people as a group have been totally neglected in bailout packages. And right now there's major, there's discussions with the federal government to create a universal income um, because of the extreme poverty uh, impacting disabled people, which, you know, who happen to, in you know, Indigenous people are amongst the highest with mental health disabilities in Ontario. So we, when we look at the intersection of disability, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a pattern of uh, structural racism going right through the social welfare system, the medical system. And, um, you know, this goes right through to housing. And so, mm. so generally good um, for white communities and privileged communities of affluence, but uh, mm. low income communities, racialized communities, are being impacted the most and this is now the big this is now uh, capturing the attention of the media more and more and something that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who has more questions? Ulla, Leif? No. Okay.
Um, but what else are your future plans besides working on the impact of COVID-19 then? Well, after that, I, I'd like to write a paper on it, but uh, then I, I, I think for, uh, I shift back to Lestadianism because I'm very, I think it's important to discuss the North American, very, very little is known about the firstborn branch of Lestadianism. And I'm very interested to write about that, but from a gendered perspective and discuss the issues. Mm. Mm. on, you know, identity issues, sexuality and sexual abuse and tie that into the greater, the greater story that's uh, unfolding or has unfolded, you know, in Finland and Norway. Mm. Mm. And to bring, to bring the, the gendered analysis and to bring that lived experience of, of people, of the Lestadians into the research focus. Mm. I have Let's, one question. Uh, how many people are considered to be Lestadians in, in Scandinavia, also here in the north of Europe? It's very, it's, I think it's a small group. I don't think it's, I think it's under 50,000 people. I'm not exactly sure. I, I know we're estimating that the Sami presence is 30 to 60,000 in North America. How many exactly are Lestadians? I'm not, I'm not sure. The it's been identified amongst Lestadians are Sami, you know, and uh, that's already been sourced. Mm. Well, then we have asked all the questions we had. So thank you very much, Terry, for oh. joining us this episode. Uh, it's very interesting. Yes. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks for having yeah. me. We're glad to have you and good luck with your research in, in the future. Thank you, Stalin. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.